All right. My name is Donnie Creekmore with Loco Populist Podcast. I'm your host, and I'm here with Adam Lustig, also known as Raw Milk Populist. How you doing, Adam? I'm doing great, Donnie. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Um, Adam's going to be our first host or our first uh, guest, and that's because he is um, a special guest. He's the original Lost Coast Populist. Um, the handle was originally his uh, Twitter Twitter handle as well as Facebook handle and I believe even a sub stack. And uh, he just so happened to own the domain lostcoastpopulous.com before he was so kind as to um, as to you know give it to to myself and our team to you know start this podcast and a bunch of, and the website and everything that's happened since. So big thanks to Adam Lustig for for that for volunteering that. Oh, you're welcome. You know, uh, I think there was a time there when I kind of was kicking around on the idea of doing some journalism and, uh, was really inspired by, you know, the, uh, California's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I thought it was, uh, over the top and too authoritarian and, uh, really inspired me to get more politically active. And I started the Substack, and I wrote this article, what happened to Humboldt? And, uh, and then I just kind of, <clears throat> kind of lost passion for that so much, uh, and started focusing more on what's been a lifelong passion of mine, which is, uh, like natural health, natural medicine, natural healing. And so now I'm currently a student, uh, I'm going to the, uh, energetic health Institute. It's an online program, uh, for, uh, to be a certified holistic nutritionist. And, uh, I think, uh, that's where I'm going to focus most of my energy now. And so when I was talking to Donnie and he said, Hey, we're going to start this local media thing because you know, there's no alternative voice to, uh, around here at all. All the media is just in sync. They're all, you know, not even just Democrats, like woke progressive Democrats. And that's the only perspective you get in any of the local media. And, you know, another thing that inspired me to do lost coast populist and kind of where I got the name was, you know, the fact with the local media that they don't even let you provide a different perspective in the comments on their social media. Nope. Um, I got banned right away by, by North Coast Journal and Lost Coast uh, <clears throat> Outpost. And then what's funny is, Donnie, since you started Lost Coast Populous, they out of nowhere blocked me. Like, I haven't been able to comment in like a year. So I, there's nothing I could have possibly done in, in this past year since they blocked me to get myself blocked from the entire site. Um, so I thought it was rather strange that all of a sudden they just arbitrarily blocked me from, I can't even go on there and read news anymore. Like I've just been completely banned from, you know, our most popular local news outlet, which is, I mean, I can go on the website, but you know, and I can't go on the Facebook. Um, I think it's kind of ridiculous, but it just goes to show how they operate. Um, and then it's funny because, you know, everybody goes on to a post and they read all the comments and they're, wow, everyone agrees. Everyone agrees with the Lost Coast Outpost perspective. They have, there's no disagreement in Humboldt. And it's, yeah, because every single person I talk to, every freedom event I go to, everyone in the GOP, anybody that's conservative, independent, populist, anything that counters their woke progressive narrative, I mean, even classic liberals got to watch what they say over there or they're just going to block you from the comments. And, you know, I even went in and emailed and they said, you know, you're spreading uh, misinformation. And I said, what, you know, what evidence do you have for this being misinformation? And they just said, it's our site and we can do what we want. So that's, you know, they're supposed to be so progressive and inclusive and everyone is welcome. But at the end of the day, no, it's their site. They can do what they want. They're basically authoritarians. So, you know, it's it's kind of funny that this way they project themselves. And, you know, I saw this same thing when we were at that uh, All Ages Drag Show event. And I'm just wearing this hat, same hat, American flag hat. And I had a War Room Posse uh, uh, sweatshirt on. And they started talking to me, flipping me off, engaging me, because they automatically assumed by what I was wearing that I was there to protest and I was with the protesters. But the reality is, is I wasn't joining the protests. Um, I was there to observe. I was there with Donnie uh, to help him in recording the event. And I honestly went to the whole thing with an open mind because I was like, I want to see firsthand for myself, like 
what's this all about, right? You know, I don't, you know, 100% believe any news outlet, you know, when I can go and see something with my own two eyes and then I can make my own decision on what I think all, about all of it. And, you know, you recorded my perspective uh, on that on that day. So that that is up on the on the YouTube Lost Coast uh, populist if anyone wants to check it out. Um, so, yeah, that's basically uh, where I came, I came up with Lost Coast uh, Populous. And, you know, now Donnie, it's Donnie's thing and he's running it. And, uh, you know, you may see a, you know, a opinion article from me here and there. You know, I'll pop in on the podcast from time to time. But, you know, this is it's Donnie's baby now. And, you know, and, and uh, I know he's got some more people involved. And, you know, we got Ash and, <coughs> and Antoinette and Jamie. And yeah, we got your Driscoll, too. Okay. And uh, we're, we're actually, I'm talking to three other potential contributors right now. And the whole idea behind the site that I'm trying to do right now is I want to, I, I kind of want it to be a safe space for freedom of speech. I want it to be a place where the humble community can go and they can contribute to the online news space and not have their voices censored. And so, I mean, we've had people contribute to our opinion section and, you know, <clears throat> you know, they've, they've, they expressed to me before they even reached out to, you know, even put in their article and they were talk, talking about how even like putting their opinion articles to the North coast journal, to the lost coast outpost time standard that, you know, on different occasions for different specific reasons, whether it be it's controversial content or uh, another person told me that they said that it was uh, disinformation and that it could possibly hurt somebody. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, and the way I look at it is like if you're if 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 you have a letter to the editor section and you're really opening that space up to the community, you need to open that space up to the community. And it needs to be governed by the First Amendment. It, not, not by, hey, you know, our publication has this opinion on, you know, masks and vaccination policies, you know, which happened to be what the person was talking about um, on the piece that was, you know, denied being published because it was disinformation and it could, you know, hurt somebody. You know, hmm. yeah, you know, right. and so, you know, we're the way we look at it is this is like, you know, I'm not going to let somebody cuss on there. I'm not going to, you know, and I know that, that I know that that's covered in freedom of speech, but I also think that there's children looking at my website. Right. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to let them use curse words. And then I'm also, you know, um, going to shy away from slanderous or libelous type things. You know what I mean? Like, so if right. someone just saying claims, but they're not like saying why they're making those claims, that's a problem. You know, if there's like, Oh, you know, X, Y, Z person's a, a piece of crap, you know, that's not going to roll. You know what I mean? You have to go, this person is a tyrant and they're a tyrant because they are behind these policies or this person's a fascist or this person, you know, is part of the woke, liber woke liberal elite. And it's like, Oh, well, why is that? Well, here's all my evidence oh, okay that makes sense mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah i mean that's the way you got to be I mean, if, if you ever watch the the great steve bannon on the war room i love him uh anytime someone makes a bold claim he's all hold on hold on stop yeah. back <laughs> that up where'd you get that from yep you know because he he the, you know he's like media matters is going to be all over me because that's what they do there's that's people true. that sit there and watch the show and pick it apart all day so, you know, he's got to be careful. And, yeah, I mean, if you're going to make claims, you know, back them up with some kind of evidence. True, true. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of claims, there was a lot of claims that were thrown around last night. Last night was, a, you know, 11-8-2022, the big midterms elections, um, or the big midterm elections, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you know, what, what uh, you know, there's lots of things happening. It looks like Carrie Lake, there were some things happening in her election, but she's pulling through now, and... You know, you've got uh, California, they called the entire state with 0% votes in. Like zero, z literally we have the screenshot, 0% mm -hmm. votes. It's on Liberty Ladies' uh, t Twitter page. And, uh, you know, that's pretty egregious. They're just calling it like, oh, Mark Moisier lost. Oh, you know, Brian Dolly lost, you know. But we, we haven't actually counted the votes. Just take our word for it, I guess. Is that, <laughs> I guess that's the, the standard bearer. I don't know. Um, I mean, California elections are, uh, I would say, n notoriously questionable. <laughs> That's it. Uh, um, yeah, I, 
I have zero faith in the California election process whatsoever. Yeah. Um, anywhere that just mails out ballots to everyone on the list. I mean, that's a classic, classic way to, to do fraudulent elections. Um, you look at all the countries where they do it, and it's places that our own government would say, like, oh, they don't have free and fair elections, right? Right. But all of a sudden we do it here. Like, even France got rid of it. Why? Because too much fraud. And they do paper ballots in person, precincts, and they know the results at the end of the night. And I don't understand why, why we can't do that. We've always done that. There's no reason to change it. It's the safest way. I think the one thing that our country is messed up on is Election Day should be a national holiday. I like the totally, mo- like totally. Nothing <clears throat> should be open. I think like, it should. Be, I think it should be hardcore, too, dude. I think it should be like. I think they should put out a postcard in advance, and it's like if you expect to vote, you fill this out. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to vote. And and the whole reason being is like, okay, if we're going to keep a mail in ballot system, let's at least make it to where they have to jump through. You have to jump through so many hoops. Because the one thing I worry about is this, is like whenever there's a government thing that started, you know what I mean? Like, like there was a time that there was no seatbelt laws, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like anytime there's something that started, it's so hard to roll it back. And it's like, is there going to be a California in the future that doesn't have melon ballots? I would love it, but I don't know if it's possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not very hopeful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you because, know, lots of work to do. Uh, after COVID and what the Democrats pulled, and you still have Newsom win in 60 40. I just, you know, even here's my, here's my thing about election fraud. Can it sway an election more than two, three, maybe five points tops? Like, I don't think they can stuff enough ballots. Yeah. yeah. You know, so realistically, there's a limit. True. And so when, you know, Newsom's winning by 17 points, like he doesn't need to cheat. Right. It's like, and if, even if there's cheating in there, it's like it's well absorbed by actual voters that are outweighing people that are just not showing up. You know, there's yeah. like, there's just voters not showing up. Well, that's a big problem, especially if you look at uh, the Humboldt local elections, right? And we've, we've sat there and we've gone through the numbers. It's true. And you look how many people that showed up to vote for Trump. Yeah. And then... What the one that really got me was the Newsom recall. Okay. <laughs> if all, if you look at all the people that voted for Trump, if they had all voted to recall Newsom, he would have been recalled. It's true. And I don't understand because they mail the ballot to your house. So who are all these Trump voters that didn't fill out their Newsom recall ballot? You know, that's a good question too. It makes me wonder. It's like, I mean, truly, it's like, are you out there and you voted, but you know, your vote wasn't counted. Is that, you know, are our votes getting, it, to me, it's like the only explanation is it's either people aren't showing up or their ballots are being thrown away. You, you know, I it's mean, hard. It's hard for me to believe that, that there's just wholesale, like there's just dumpsters being filled with ballots. And I mean, maybe, I don't know. There was some shenanigans for sure in <clears> LA <throat> because I know a lot of people in the Valley and I talked to people, uh, that personally that had this problem and is I've seen this around the country too. Is it ha- seems to only happen to Republicans, but <laughs> you go in to vote and they're like, "Oh, you already voted." Mm. It, it, according to our records, you already voted. Mm. So basically, what somebody did is vote in your name and put it in the system and probably voted Democrat. And so, how much of that is going on? And is it enough to sway an election that much? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the question. Um, the whole answer is just basically the whole system needs a good overhaul and needs the belt tightened everywhere. It can. Back to paper ballots, right. precincts, right. ID. Look, you got to show your ID to rent a hotel room, to get on a plane, to purchase alcohol or tobacco, to, you know, anything. Yeah. You got to have ID. It's absolutely insane. And it's so just- you got to have ID to vote. And what's funny is, Polling actually shows nationwide it's like a 70% issue regardless of party. This isn't even partisan. It's such a fringe belief to be like, oh, we don't need voter ID. It's like, yeah, yeah, actually we do. We, we do. I mean, I, I just, what's the, what would be the justification for not having ID? For not, you know, like how is that, how is that possible that it's like denying anybody a, a, the ability to vote when it's so easy to go get an ID? You know what I mean? Like it's not, there's no, there's no excuse, you know, like it's like if you, if you can get an ID, you can, I mean, I think that 
correct me if I'm wrong, but can't illegal aliens even get IDs in California? Correct. Yes, they can. So even there for, I'm just, and I'm just working through the justification from the mindset of, you know, a liberal, a leftist or whatever, who believes a Democrat who believes that, you know, anybody who waltzes into California across the Southern border, you know, has the right to vote in our elections, has the right to get an ID legally. You know, if if that's possible, if they can actually get an ID and they're not, you know, a true United States citizen, they're honestly not a true California citizen, but they can do that, then why, you know what I mean? Like, where's the, it's kind of funny because even they're not showing up really, or is that what's, you know, I don't know. The whole thing is just, the whole thing just needs, the whole thing's just shit needs to be fixed. Well, the only logical reason to not have voter ID is to make it easier to cheat. Right. I mean, there really is no other logical reason. Uh, You know, when you hear these white liberal idiots say, oh, you're like disenfranchising people of color. Every, you know, quote unquote person of color uh, that I've spoke to. Thinks that's like the most racist shit they ever heard. No, well, wait a minute. Like, Hold like, on. You're gonna assume because I have dark colored skin that I don't have ID. I like actually, how racist is so that? So check this out, dude. I actually didn't know this, but I'm a person of color. Oh, really? 100 percent true story. Because, because of your Cherokee heritage. Well, you know, no, yes, because of my Cherokee heritage, and but I didn't know that that made me a person of color until I logged on to Facebook and I was making the lost coast populist uh, channel and mm-hmm. I was dialing it in. It was like, Oh, let's get your diversity information on the record. And I was like, Oh, okay, let's get my diversity information on the record. This should be interesting. And you know, it pretty much was because it said, are you a native American? I'm like, Oh yeah, I am a native American. You know, I'm a literally a card carrying Cherokee nation um, citizen. And so <laughs> I, and then it said that I was basically a person of color and I don't know. I thought that was fascinating because, you know, I would never have assumed that I could have such an esteemed title. Right. You know, I, I think all this talk of, you know, this diversity and equity and this going back in the past and, you know, attacking white people for being so-called colonizers is all of this is it's just divisive rhetoric because at the end of the day, skin color is irrelevant, you know, and that's that's the thing that we need to that should be accepted everywhere. Like you shouldn't even think anything about someone based solely on the color of their skin. It doesn't indicate anything about them that, yeah. you, you know, any preconceived prejudice or notion or discrimination in your head shouldn't even be there. Like that's the goal. That's where we need to get to. And by we shouldn't even have to talk about it. We know? shouldn't talk about it. You know, you know, it shouldn't even be a thing. It, right. Um, I just, saw an interview with Morgan Freeman years ago. Is he's like, you know how we get rid of racism? We stop talking about race. Right. Right. I do remember that. Like now, I mean, there's one race, the human race. Like we all bleed red. Like a- anything else is nonsense. And, you know, it's just divisive rhetoric meant to weaken us as people so we can be controlled. It's it's just a tactic of the privileged elite to keep the populace in line. Like we're too busy fighting with each other over nonsense to pay attention to how they're completely controlling our life and centralizing everything and hoarding all the wealth and our standing or living keeps going down and you know real wages keeps going down. The only time it went up in 40 years was under Trump. Now it's going back down again. So you know your wages in relation to the cost of living has just been on the steady decline since the 50s. Check it. So anybody who doubts, there's the uh, the Morgan Freeman. This is an interview uh, with Mike Wallace. Black History Month you find ridiculous. Why? You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come well, on. What do you no. do with yours? What, which month is White History Month? <laughs> no, well, no, no, come on. Tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay, which I'm month is Jewish History Month? Uh, there isn't one. Oh, oh, why not? Yeah. Do you want one? No, no, <laughs> no. I, 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 I don't either. I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. How are we going to get rid of racism? And until... stop talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop calling you a white man. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to stop calling me. A black man. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. You 
And there it was. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, you know, I right? thought we were on that path. I thought we had that figured out. Like America was getting so much better. If I look <clears> at, <throat> oh, let's say my grandfather compared to my parents, right? I just look at the world from the time I was born in the 70s until now. And it, up until all of this divisive rhetoric came up, it seemed to me like we were finally getting over the hump on this stuff. It seemed to me like it was getting better. Was it perfect? No. Is anywhere perfect? No. No. That's an unrealistic expectation. If we're, you know, perfect is the expectation, we're always going to fail. But the point is, is that it was moving in a good direction steadily for decades. It was getting better and better with each generation. And now it's going backwards. Oh, dude, now 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 you have literally like some of the world's best black comedians. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The best American comedians of all, Dave Chappelle, mm-hmm. and you know he gets canceled. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well they try to cancel. Him. They try, well, they try to cancel him, but you can't cancel Chappelle. You know, but I mean that guy. I mean he's he's an icon. You know, he's a legend, and. To think that this tiny fraction of our society, this loud minority, you know, could, you know, you know, could try to cancel Chappelle. It's like that. Yeah, you can do it at the altar and the sacrifice of your own credibility over time because it's like, you know, like, go for it. Yeah, you go try to cancel Chappelle. And we actually all saw how that played out. Yeah, it's ridiculous. You know, and we've had this conversation many times, but it's interesting that you go back in history, right? And you look at the history of the world. And up until basically Western civilization took hold, the whole world was a brutal place where people fought one another, regardless of skin color, over land and property and wealth and whatever. The, there was, the way to acquire wealth was through violence, was through power. You know, basically... <laughs> That was the way of the world. So if you study the history of Africa or Japan or, you know, you look at, a, you know, Genghis Khan or, I mean, on and on, Europe and the history, constantly, you look at the Vikings would conquer a neighboring village and they would come in and they would kill the men. They would take the children as slaves. They would take the women as wives or slaves and they would take everything that they had. And that's what they did. Yeah. And then they would pop over to England and do it there. And, you know, I mean... It's Every, absolutely brutal. Brutal. Everyone did it. The North America before we got here, I mean, they had warriors. What what do you think they were warring? You know, <laughs> like they were warring each other. These different nations of of Native Americans would expand, you know, through, you know, fighting and for the land. And so, you know, this whole concept of stolen land, like, you know, if you look at the history of Mount Rushmore, right? When I looked it up, there was like six or eight different tribes that held it before the the U.S. government finally claimed it, right? True. So, like, who stole it? Stole it from who? Stole it from who? So, it, was, yeah. it, was the, it wasn't stolen. It was conquered. And that was the way of the world. It, I'm not saying it was right. I abhor violence. I mean, to me, violence is the last resort of a defeated intellect. Like, I do not like violence at all. I don't like war. There's, there's nothing glorious about it. Um, but I'm also, you know... A realist and I understand history and that was the way of the world doesn't make it right but you have to understand that to go back and target one group you know white European people and say they are the colonizers for doing the same thing that everyone else had always done for centuries well the, the thing that I think doesn't make any sense the fascinating like like leap of faith or, or not, not leap of faith I should say a, a huge leap of like psychological like you know dissonance to me is you know they they, they fault these people like a hundred years ago but you know these people didn't have time machines you right. know what I mean they weren't aware yeah. of of what currently today is not accepted you know the status quo today is not something that they they were aware of back when they were alive. And it's like for us to fault long dead people or even the ancestors of the ancestors of long dead people for X, Y, Z of whatever they did in the past. And, you know, like, I, like the whole idea of reparations, I think is very much similar uh, to like, I think I, I would bet a hundred bucks that Morgan Freeman would be a hundred percent against the idea of, of reparations. You know what I mean? It, it's hard to say because if you you see him talk recently, it's different than 2003. 
True, true. Things have changed for everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's know, true, that's not, true. Yeah. His perspective has become a little bit more mainstream. Yeah. So, you know, he's kind of, you know, he's a, he's a star Every, and he's in the spotlight and he's got a publicist under the pressure. and they're under the pressure. I mean, yeah. so, you know, that that's hard to say. But, you know, it's interesting because what they don't talk about is, you know, what what changed in the world? How did we break that cycle? Not that it's completely broken because, I mean, heck, you see what's going on in Russia and you see what China's doing with their expansion plans and, you know, you see what goes on in other parts of the world and there's definitely, you know, people still fighting over land and resources and these, you know, we're still having wars and conflicts. So it hasn't completely gone away, but it's no longer the way of the world. You know, as, a, as Americans, the past couple hundred years, we've grown up in in a society where, you know, you don't have to worry about the neighboring tribe coming by and like killing you and taking all your stuff. You know, I mean, that's so that's that's basically Western civilization. And, you know, if you study the history of the abolitionist movement, which ended slavery, okay, slavery was the way of the world for thousands of years. And what finally ended that was the abolitionist movement. And if you study the abolitionist movement, you see it was started by Quakers in England and in America. Quakers, white Christian men, basically. Wasn't who, it the Republican? They built the Republican Party, right? Well, that's another story. So, you hmm. know, you had these white Christian men that helped push forward the abolitionist movement. Then eventually you had the Republican Party. That was a political party that was formed on the platform of ending slavery. That was the original platform of the Republican Party. And it's interesting you bring that up because I was talking with my son Miles the other day and uh, he said that when he was in school at Jacoby Creek, his teacher, she basically, when she was talking about the Civil War, she mentioned that the Republicans started the party because of slavery and then she had to throw in there, but the party changed. I've it's heard, not. It's not the same Republican Party. I've heard that. I've no, I've found no evidence of that. I found no evidence of that either. Other yeah. than it's a Democrat talking point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's you know that's what's going on in our schools. This is this is people are wondering like how did we do so poorly in the midterms? And I think there was a twenty nine percent swing with Gen Z voters, basically eighteen to twenty nine, twenty eight percent in favor of the Democrats. D plus twenty eight. And you're wondering how this happens. And it's like, well, you look at the indoctrination at the schools. You know, I saw this other graphic that was showing uh, people that donated to each party and what they did for work. And there was this giant blue circle that said teachers on the side of the Democrats. And you look at the teacher unions and they're like, you know, 90 percent Democrat. So you have all these Democrat teachers in our schools. And this is the kind of stuff they're slowly indoctrinating your kids with their Democratic uh, and liberal perspectives they're injecting it into the curriculum wherever they can and they're <clears> slick <throat> about it and they're a bunch of activists and you know you really have to watch out for it because the media the mainstream media and the mainstream narrative has these people convinced that donald trump is some cross between nazis and you know like hitler and satan and that we're all white supremacists and we're dangerous and we're trying to bring fascism to america and that democracy is on the ballot and all this other dumb stuff. And so these people that actually believe it, they got themselves in a frenzy. Yeah. I mean, imagine if yeah. you actually believe that. What what wouldn't you do to ensure that Hitler and his and this fascist regime didn't take control of the country? Would you help rig an election? Yeah. Would you help to indoctrinate children to be liberals? Probably. I mean, wouldn't you do anything you could? To stop these evil white supremacist Nazi fascists from taking over? Well, I mean, right here, we're doing everything that we think that we should be doing to fight back. Right. You know what I mean? So that's the answer. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's just that we just know that. I mean, okay, so like we know that that's the issue over there. But the problem, too, that a lot of people might not be aware of that the both of us are intimately aware of is the failings of the Republican Party. Like, yeah, they were built on really altruistic you know, um, foundations, basically, you know, the ending of slavery and stuff like that. And then as our country's grown, you know, the government itself has become this huge beast. And now, you know, you see like 
what we would call rhino Republicans, you know what I mean? Republicans in name only, trans Republicans, you know, they identify as Republicans. And, and these folks, you know, they're the ones that will basically vote with people on big budget bills and pass things through and stuff that, you know, no, no run of the mill American actually supports. Right. You mean like 40 billion to Ukraine? Correct. And so like, you know, and in those situations, you know, but the, the thing that's fascinating to me that I learned the hard way and that you learned the hard way is, you know, we both volunteered our hard time and our efforts and our talents to the humble, um, the humble Republican uh, Central Committee, which is a long mouthful. But basically, it's the local Republican Party in Humboldt County. And, you know, we were doing the precinct strategy as laid out by, you know, uh, Bannon and all the his guests that he have has on there. And, <clears throat> and, you know, you know how that turned out. Yeah, you know. I think, uh, you know, looking back on it, you know, I can definitely like Monday morning quarterback where I think we could have done things differently. Totally. I underestimated uh, what we were up against. Uh, I would say going in there, I really felt that a lot of them were good, hardcore MAGA Republicans and that they were about freedom and they and the Constitution and um, I mean, well, they dress the dress and they definitely talk the talk. They do. And that's the thing. And that, that's the thing I learned. And, and any of you trying to get involved with the GOP, you really got to watch it with these people because a lot of them are neocon conservatives and they don't necessarily like MAGA, but they'll pretend to like MAGA and they'll pretend that they like Trump. Because it's not politically smart in the Republican Party to not do that now. Right, right. But you start to realize that a lot of them are really establishment types. Um, you know, I think what we ran into here, I, I doubt that, you know, we we tried to bring them dragging and kicking into the 21st century when it comes to cannabis. That's a fact. And, and technology, too. And technology. And I think they, I doubt we're the first people that tried to get the Humboldt GOP to change their perspective on cannabis. I have a feeling that, you know, some of these people, their hatred for cannabis goes back decades. Totally. And that they, it's the culture wars that have gone on around here. I mean, they wouldn't even discuss it, you know, they wouldn't even discuss it. And here we are not, not only in California, but in Humboldt County where we're trying to win elections. And, you know, this is the cannabis capital of the world. And to be a political party, that's national party doesn't even have anything in their platform specifically anti-cannabis and the local party decides, well, we're going to go ahead and be anti-cannabis. It just, it seemed to me right away that they're not trying to win elections. It's not what this is about. Exactly. You know, the, the thing that was frustrating for me too, is that it all kind of blindsided me. I thought that they knew damn well who I was and what I was about when I joined. I mean, uh, they had, they'd come to, I mean, a whole handful of them had come to Humboldt Freedom Coalition events multiple times. They'd, they'd saw both of us speak. You know what I mean? They, they'd, you know, they've spoken to me multiple times in the crowd and things and, uh, you know, on the side of different events. So they knew who I was and, you know, and just, just so, you know, who, if you, ha if, if you're crew queuing into this and you're like, what are these guys talking about? What ha basically happened was, is, um, you know, I wanted to write a blog piece that's now available on um, lostcoastpopulist.com called Cannabis, a Defamed National Treasure. That basically is a huge deep dive into the history of cannabis and everything like that and goes back to, like, you know, the nation's founding and stuff. And uh, definitely take a look. But long story short, I wanted to publish that on the Republicans' website because I found not only biblical references but Republican references and straight-up, like, hardcore, like, historical American references to cannabis that I had never heard before. And it all looked good from the optical viewpoint of like, okay, we're Humboldt County. Like we're the cannabis capital of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as Republicans in Humboldt County, like strategically, you know, we should be all of branching at fucking very, I'm oh, sorry. I shouldn't go. I just have to beat that one out. We should be all of branching. I'm just passionate about this. We should be all of branching at very least to the cannabis industry and, you know, bringing those that are that kind of like 60 to 70 percent of their core values align with the Republican ticket. 
Correct. They should be brought into under the, you know, okay, great. You, you like to, oh, great. Well, there's people that smoke cigarettes. There's people that drink alcohol. There's people that smoke weed and we're the party of freedom and liberty. Like your vice is your business, not ours. We're the, we're the party of small government, I thought. Okay. Yeah. And so it's like, and freedom and liberty and yeah. the constitution. And-, and I mean, like I was literally walking the district. I was g- gearing up to f- fully support this this current, this, this past election now, last night, I, w- I was literally walking the district. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. You got elected district chair. I, yeah, I got electric district chair of fifth district and I got elected to that position. And so the, the fascinating thing about it is, is just because of this whole cannabis con- controversy, they constructed this Fake narrative? Fake narrative. Thank you. I was trying not to curse. (laughs) I was like, how can I not say cow manure? It it, it was straight out of the Democrat playbook. Yeah. It was like the the Nancy Pelosi wrap-up smear. They They basically (laughs) said that they felt physically threatened and anxiety because of this guy. This guy right here. I I was just like, are we talking about the same Donnie? Because he gets a little animated when yeah, he talks sometimes. I get passionate. I'm passionate. I mean, I, I thought his Democrats were snowflakes. I was triggered. But apparently, like, we have even bigger snowflakes than the humble GOP. And they can't handle somebody passionate about their ideas. So these guys, they, they hired, they literally hired a security guard. Who, by the way, was like, why am I here? <laughs> he, the first time he actually was falling asleep and stuff because it was such a boring meeting. Right. So they, they like, hired this guy, really? <laughs> they hired a security guard and the security guard came to three different meetings and he was just sitting there and the whole thing, the whole, the whole idea was that, you know, something was going to happen and then, you know, good old Donnie Creek is going to lose his mind and he's going to, he's going to be aggressive and start, I don't know what they were going to think. I don't know what they were told. I have no idea. They didn't think anything. They, <laughs> they were making up an entire fake yeah. narrative so then they could get all the votes to vote you out because yeah. all they're concerned with is maintaining their power, not winning elections. <laughs> so that's what happened. He's saying the quiet part out loud, folks. I mean, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm over here calling balls and strikes, man. You call, call me the umpire. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. And so, yeah. And I mean, we, I mean, you should have, I mean, if you could have been there, the kangaroo court that they set up when they actually voted me off, it was like, it was like, uh, I've never seen anything like it. It was some third <laughs> world stuff. Like, so you have three people that are on the executive committee, then they all have their spouses also on the committee as voters. And then like their friends. And it was basically the whole, the whole thing was already set. They already knew how they all were going to vote. They went through the motions that they had everybody speak. There's some very passionate speakers you know, the whole thing, we called out everything they were doing and they're like, okay, yeah, that's good. Let's vote. And, you know, Donnie had one guy who flipped on him who said he was going to help. Good. And then one guy who decided to quit before the vote that could have voted. <laughs> yeah. And then someone else who was on an airplane that was going to vote with us. And so basically yeah. they just squeaked by, barely so, got the yeah. vote and got rid of Donnie. And the thing is, is Donnie redid the entire website for free. He spent (laughs) tons of hours, like more hours than any volunteer put in the entire year. Donnie puts in to redo the website for them. You know, this guy, he's out, nobody's walking their districts. He's out walking his district. He's having parties at his house to get Republicans together. Like, I I mean, mean, I really wanted to win, dude. Really wanted to win. You were the best volunteer there. You went above and beyond. And simply because you wanted to express your view on cannabis. Yeah. Which, you know, Newsflash would probably help us get some votes. Um, well, you know what's a fascinating correlation, though, now that I think about it, is they actually share something in common with uh, with Biden's um, Department of Justice because they actually also think that marijuana smokers and cannabis growers and cannabis people, uh, you know, air quotes, are too dangerous to own firearms. Correct. Yeah. So it's it's one thing where the... You know, the, the neocons and the neoliberals, they all they all get together on that and they agree. Yeah, they sound the, the local humble GOP stands with uh, the Biden DOJ on, you know, the idea that marijuana smokers, cannabis smokers, um, people who are lawfully, you know, following what was voted in by we the people in California, following the California Constitution, those people that they're too dangerous to own a firearm, you know. Right. 
Yeah, because because stuff. people smoke weed and shoot people all the time, but they never drink and shoot people. That doesn't ever happen. <laughs> Alcohol is never involved in a shooting. Yeah. From last I checked, I, I want to say that when you drive and you drink too much, it increases the potential of you getting in an accident. And if you get in an accident, you could potentially kill somebody and yourself, your passengers too. Correct. Right. You know, and I'm not saying that it doesn't happen if you smoke too much weed and drive, but it seems to me that if that were happening at the same rates, you would have probably heard about it by now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There'd have been, I mean, I don't know. I mean, people have been smoking major amounts of cannabis in California for decades, long before we had the medical thing. And if there were going to be problems, we would have seen them. And uh, if there are going to be major problems here in Humboldt specifically, we definitely would have seen them. You know, and, and another, we're not seeing them. Another thing that you were a witness to, too, that's actually goes even deeper on this, that goes beyond the whole cannabis thing, is that, um, you know, when when they denied my ability to publish the cannabis article, you know, I was fascinated by the idea that, you know, a small group, like literally three people, could just make the decision that this isn't happening at all. Like, I'm sorry, Republican that's volunteering no and i was like is that really how this works yeah they stack the board with their spouses yeah. and their friends well a but, bunch of proxy votes but it's beyond the voting though but what i realized i was like wait a minute isn't there there's got to be rules there's got to be a rule book there's got to be well, bylaws well, look how long it took you to get the bylaws and now they went and changed all uh, the bylaws exactly so i we, mean it's just like the most blatant abuse yeah. of power you've ever seen i mean because leading up to the whole These leading up to, republicans yes republicans in name only uh leading up to the whole kangaroo court you know i, I learned that basically the bylaws wherever the bylaws were silent you know, Robert's rules of order took over. And so I was like, okay, what's that? And I learned it's like this huge, you know, uh, rule book on how to properly conduct yourself in a parliamentary situation, you know? And so any board meeting, they usually follow this thing. And so I was like, okay, well, I obviously I need to see the bylaws first because if I don't know where the bylaws are silent, I don't know where this book even picks up from. But at least because I didn't have access to the bylaws, I was like, okay, well, like, at least I can order this book off as Amazon. You know what I mean? Right. You know, obviously. And yeah. so I ordered a book off as Am I ordered two different styles. Like one's like the actual one is like this thick, it's huge. And then another one was like kind of like the idiot's version. So that way I was like, okay, if to, you know, get to the point on certain things, you know? And so um, long story short, short you know, uh, it was a gentleman named Mark who was the treasurer at the time who eventually emailed everybody the bylaws and they were actually old bylaws, but the, those old bylaws, they showed how, um, back in 2013, if anybody were to have run for candidacy and for office that they, they'd immediately be disqualified for serving in their position in the local GOP, which makes sense because you, you can't give one Republican an edge over another one. I mean, it all, it's logical, but they, right. but they did, did away with that. Like, like Colonel, yeah. Colonel West in Texas, when he ran for governor, he stepped down as head of the Texas GOP. I mean, right. That's, just, that's what people do. That's what people do. But for whatever reason, Douglas Brower and company, they thought that, you know, Hey, you know, historical and national precedent aside, you know, we're just going to not do that. And we're going to stay the heads of this executive committee and the chair, even though I'm running a campaign. And I think part of that yeah. is literally at that point, at that time, no one else wanted to be chair and they didn't have any volunteers. It could be, it could be that simple. No, That's what it was. But, yeah. You know, and then we all showed up and we actually, for the first time in who knows when, we filled every slot. True. And true. then we filled all the committee slots and then they ran us all off. True, true. And now they're back to a skeleton of what they were. Right, right. <laughs> and then and the thing about it too is this though, is that like, you know, I made it clear to them. I told them in an email, I said, look, I'm going to stand up this day. And I'm going to, because I, what I learned basically is once we got the bylaws and once I got Robert's Rules of Order, I learned that I could basically go to any Republican meeting where I lived. And I, as soon as I'm an officer, so I'm like, as soon as you're voted in, if you're fifth district chair or if you're on the fifth district as just like a, um, a precinct captain, you know, so you have a, you have the ability to vote, right? And you have the ability to speak. You can actually be an associate member. 
Well, in the past you could when that yeah. existed. Yeah, they got rid of that. They got rid of that. But because you, I was going to be an associate member, You're like, oh, we can't have this guy. <laughs> you know, we can't have Adam speaking because that guy spit fire. Yeah, I'm way too disruptive. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, they did away with those. But you know, the whole thing though is that once we learned basically the levers of power in the local Republican Party, the people's the people who made it clear, like myself and Adam, that we were going to stand up at this next meeting and we were going to go, hey you know, I want to put this motion forward to a debate and I want to vote it. And I'm not asking you for your permission. I'm asking the entire body of us to decide this as a body. Once we made it clear that we knew how to do that, literally it was like 10 days later, it was like, Donnie's got to go. He's too dangerous. We got to hire a security guard. Well, you know, we, we found out what people have found out around the country. And I want to read this one tweet that uh, I retweeted today. Uh, it's from Gavin Wax. Uh, he is the chairman of the New York Young Republicans Committee, right? And he nailed it. He said, 90% of local Republican parties are literally just paper. They exist on paper. Titles, some votes at a state convention, and maybe a few thousand in the bank from the last chicken dinner. This is not the institution that is going to whip votes and win an election. He nailed it, and that's what yep. we ran into. They do their, you know, rubber chicken dinners, and they're, you know, every once in a while, and they get the same people to put in some money and they buy some mailers that everybody throws in the trash. Nobody looks at. And you know, they're totally disorganized. They didn't have updated lists for us to walk our precincts, everything. They, they they were all technophobic. And so you, Donnie comes in and they want to do all this technological stuff, but then, you know, then they're not, then they want to control everything. I mean, it's just like, it was such a dysfunctional and toxic mess. It, it's no wonder this is like, D38 or whatever it is around here. Like it's not even close because if you look at the left up here, they're highly organized. You have like NGOs and different organizations. They're going out getting Soros money and other money and they're funneling it through all their projects and they're, they're getting candidates and they're getting them out to out and getting them, uh, you know, into the races and they're supporting them with their local media apparatus and, you know, they're, they're a well-oiled machine. And then, you know, you go down to the GOP headquarters and, you know, they don't even know how to, you know, we're like, get on social media. Like, how do we post on Facebook? You know, <laughs> I'm like, seriously, like three-year-old kids post on Facebook. Like, oh, dude. You don't know how to post on Facebook? I mean, th- this is the level of incompetence that's there. And the thing is, is they don't want new young Republicans coming in. Well, no, be- they do, but they only those that will just, they can control like a little robot. Well, only those that, that, you know, share all their, you know, conservative beliefs across the board. And, you, you know, in polling, 56% of registered Republicans support cannabis legalization. Okay. It's like a 79 and 80 something percent across the board issue, but 56% of Republicans. Now, what, Per, like, what's the average age of that 56%? It's the younger Republicans. Totally. Okay? Yeah, totally. It's not the elderly Republicans very much. It's mostly that among the, you know, the young right, the new right. And it's, uh, they're just, you know, they're dug in and they're holding on for dear life and they don't want to let go of their power, but it's, you know, sinking their party and they just don't see it. Well, I mean, look at it from their perspective. I mean, they can, they can you know, extract donations every single year and then they can throw these cool little parties and then they can elbow around with like these, you know, Republican celebrities in their own mind and then take their selfies with them and then, you know, spend four and a half hours trying to post it to Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) Oh God. It's just like, it's so pathetic. Oh, and they get their passes at the fair and they can walk around. You know, know, what's a a funny thing is... The funny thing, too, is this whole thing. So, like, you know, so they vote me off of the humble GOP, you know, and when they first had me take over their website, they were like, oh, Donnie, you need to look into this and spearhead this and take this over and, you know, take over the website. And, okay, cool. And I looked into it and it was owned by a private party. Like it wasn't even owned like the domain domains have have paperwork, kind of like cars, you know, mm-hmm. and it was owned by a private party, like a private party's credit card was on file that was paying for the domain for the Humboldt County Republicans. And I was like, this is problematic. You you know, you guys have a, you guys have a bank account. 
this should be tied directly to it. Like, obviously, you know, you, like, obviously, like, it's like, you don't even have, like, I, I shouldn't even have to explain this to a camera right now. It's so retarded. And so, but anyways, you know, I explained it to him, like, this is problematic. And, you know, we're at the action window right now of when you can t- take this over and, you know, you have to do this and, and it never happened. Like it never, it was like every time I tried to get them to like do the things that they needed to do to own their own website, it was, they were so technologically adverse. And then also just like not willing to learn that Mm -hmm. at a certain point I was like, Hey, I'm just going to just do the same thing that happened before. And I guess I'm going to own it. And they're like, yeah, I guess let's just do that. It's easier. And I was just like, "Uh, uh, okay, I, I guess, guess we're just doing that. And so I just talked, you know, sold it to myself and I put it, put my paperwork on it. I put it in my, with the rest of the domains that I own. And I was like, wow, this is really, really weird that I can't believe. And I, but I was like, okay, get over that. You've got some volunteering to do. You got a website to build. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was a weird, a, you built a great website. Right. You know, it was a weird experience, but I was like, whatever, I, you know, they're at least, you know, they just have that faith in me. So cool. So like, I just, I'm, get, I'm getting in there and I'm, I'm building this website. And it was like this super badass website. Everybody loved it. Right. And and the thing that was fascinating to me, though, is that when they voted me off, they thought that after lying to my face, lying to my friends, making up slanderous and libelous uh, accusations about me and my good character, that I was just going to just go, oh, here's the website that I built for you guys, and here's the keys here you go, and you can just guys just have this back. Here you go, and you know, and now you know. Even though you couldn't do figure out how to do this before, you know, now that I'm kicked off, it's like now it's like a priority, and I'm just gonna hey, you know, keep on volunteering for these people that just like can't even stand to have me in a room without a security guard. You know, they're playing the Democrat playbook against me. I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? And so the day after, I mean, I remember going to sleep that night and going like, what am I gonna do with this website? What am I gonna do with this website? And I just like been listening to this Foo Fighters song, you know, just the song Pretenders. And I was like, they're pretenders. And so I just like I just took the whole website down and I actually saved it. So I have the whole thing because I was like, okay, at least maybe I can sell it to him or something. You know, I'm not gonna give it to him for free. Like I've worked on this thing for hours and hours and hours, you know. And now they just like kick me in the dick. Like, no, I'm not gonna give it over to him for free. And so like, dude, like you know. Like now Humboldt GOP, like I own HumboldtGOP.org, you know, and I'm like, what am I going to do with that? Like, so I guess I, I just renamed it to the Humboldt Guild of Patriots. So then at least it like, it better represents the, the, the mindset of the conservatives and the Republicans and the independents that consider themselves like patriotic Americans here, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. it's, it seems to me like it's the GOP up here has been a mess for a while. That's why you see so many splintered off conservative groups that don't really associate with them because I mean, I heard stories before we started work doing stuff with them. And then I saw more of the same stuff that from the stories I heard. So, you know, it, 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 there, it needs a complete overhaul uh, to ever be something useful. So, you know, I think that, I think we've covered that quite a bit. Um, yeah. you know, let's, let's talk about the midterms. Yeah, 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 dude. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. That's, uh, it's been a, not what I expected. No, I mean, you know, I think uh, a lot of us had high hopes. Um, but you know, in the end, I think it, it I mean, it, it is a, a Republican victory, uh, oh, yeah. overall. Oh, hundred percent. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, I, 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 I can see where the G, the establishment GOP was definitely they're trying to take down Trump as usual right and where they can get together and work with the democrats on that they will big surprise um, yeah so an interesting story i heard today uh, i was listening to Richard Barris the people's pundit and he had been working with John Gibbs in Michigan who's running for uh, the house of representatives and basically, Gibbs told him that after he won his primary, he didn't hear from Kevin McCarthy for weeks. And then when he finally did, McCarthy's like, yeah, I got money for you, but you got to fire your people and you got to take on our consultants. So I'm sure Gibbs wasn't the only one they did this to. And then an interesting thing came up where they really started attacking Gibbs about abortion because, you know, that's the 
the Dems big thing this cycle, the Dobbs decision, and you know, I remember that, that. whole that yeah. whole rhetoric, right? Yeah. And they advised him to ignore it and not address it and just talk about crime. Big mistake. Big mistake, right? And it it it's hard to believe that some of that's not intentional. Like, are they really that dumb? Um, and my my big problem is. You know, I look and they're like, oh, George Soros spent $120 million on this election. And then you're like, you see Trump and all his endorsements, right? But like, he was he doesn't give money to the people he endorses. So they got to go beg into the RNC, and the RNC hates MAGA, and they're trying to destroy Trump. So, you know, you have this big conflict of interest there. Mm. And I, I and I don't even think Trump understands the extent of how much they're against him because he keeps saying that he endorses Kevin McCarthy and he thinks McCarthy should be speaker. And at the same time, McCarthy, there was like six primary races that he was donating money against the Trump endorsed candidates. It's so confusing. Right. So, you know, it's pretty obvious that the establishment GOP is working against Trump and Trumpism. They don't want MAGA taking over their party. You know, they want to keep it rolling like they do, uh, taking care of all their elite donors and keeping the money rolling. Have you have, you have you thought about maybe that, like, you know, Trump's Trump's strategy there is to consistently send in new soldiers like me and you to do the, you know what I mean, getting us? I don't think Trump has that much strategy. No. No. I'm talking Honestly, about. Honestly, I just don't. You know what I mean? You know, some people think he's this, like, tactical genius. Um, I think he's a, you know. I think he's a good businessman and he understands how to get things done. Uh, he's got a lot of experience with that. I think he's good at cutting deals, yeah. but uh, I think he's horrible at selecting people to work for him. A hundred percent. Like one of the worst. Yeah. And uh, I think his ego gets in his way a lot. I, you know, I think it's, I think it's fascinating that he was able to accomplish and, and you know, cause I would say that like his administration was the best four years in this country that I'd lived through in my lifetime, just economically and everything like that. And it's fascinating to me that that was even accomplishable with the people he chose well, and, you know, with, uh, you know, all the attacks that were constantly coming at him. Well, he had some good people in there and they were fighting hard for him. And, you know, here's the thing. I think Trump's an honest guy. I think Trump's a well-intentioned guy. I think he's the best president of the modern, you know, U.S. history. And I think he really does want to fight for people. But, you know, there's the other things I said, you know, there's, yeah. you know, yeah. he's flawed like any other human. True, true. Um, you know, and a lot of people are like, oh, this means DeSantis is the guy and, you know, and so there was a, you, you saw right away, you saw a lot of uh, conservative influencers start coming out and talking about DeSantis and talking down on Trump. And it almost seems pre-planned, right? Oh, dude, there's like, a, there's a huge know, industry out there. Yeah. So they're, they're definitely, there's a big segment of people trying to push DeSantis. They want to take Trump down. You know, my personal opinion is, uh, you know, I would look at both candidates I can't say right now, you know, who I would vote for. Um, I think they're both good. I think they both, you know, have their potential issues. Uh, when I look at Ron DeSantis' list of donors in his pack, I, I, I'm not excited about who I see. But then again, you know, Trump took a million dollars from Pfizer and pushed the jabs on everybody. So, you know, True. and, you know, I don't like that DeSantis cozies up to some rhinos, but geez, Trump's cozying up to these rhinos all the time too. Right. So, you right. know, it's a lot of these things are like a wash when I compare the two of them. And if I think about somebody who's, who's a more effective leader and gets things done, uh, you know, DeSantis is, he's got Florida humming, man. Like it's true. He's doing a really good job. He seems to be in the right place on the issues he's leading. Like the other governor, Republican governors are like, what's the Santa's doing? And then they copy him. I mean, he's really leading the governor, the Republican governors of America. Oh yeah. And he's running a clinic on how to do things. So, you know, there's a lot of upside with DeSantis. You know, the, the thing though, that uh, the only thing that I would punch back on that whole deal too. And I, and I think that DeSantis, I mean, this is a, don't get me wrong. I think that DeSantis should run for president. I totally do. I just don't think he should run for president in 2024. I think that uh, 2024 is a ticket that belongs to Trump as the Republican nominee. And that's just because of J6. It's because of the 3 November mo movement. 
it's it's because of the fact that there's still guys rotting in you know the gulag the federal mm-hmm. gulag yeah and it's all under this precedence that you know before the trump administration no one had ever said anything about our election integrity or anything you yeah. know but it's like but, but hey i mean i i watched i i watched the entirety of um of uh what's it called switchwire no what's that freaking hbo documentary on was that kill switch kill or? switch thank you yeah thank oh, you yes oh, and the, the, there's that and then there's or kill chain kill, kill chain, chain. good work was, good work kill chain yeah no kill chain was basically you know like their mike lindell movie or whatever yeah it like, was seriously. it was 100 percent same thing yeah and you know, and you go back and you watch congressional hearings with Klobuchar and Kamala and, you know, uh, Pocahontas, Warren, and, you know, and they're all talking about the machines. A whole lot and, of them. Yeah. And then you go back to 2016 when they were all objecting to the election. And basically, they objected to every election going all the way back, I think, 90. Six or ninety two. Russia, or Russia, Russia. Oh, yeah. No, they this is what they do. You know, and it's just so hypocritical. It just shows you how low information their voters are. I mean that I, they just don't even see this stuff. And you know, if we had an honest media, this wouldn't even be close. There wouldn't even be a Democrat party. It's true, it's true. I mean, a lot of it is is that people don't hold their feet to the fire, you know, like it's like you're saying, you know, like how can they get away with just pivoting consistently from one thing it's like it's like uh they're neo you know and he's like in that scene where he's getting shot and every because they, they control all of the media <laughs> they got and the mayo in the matrix so no matter what actually happens yeah. it doesn't matter it doesn't because they just put out their narrative like did donnie actually do anything to make people feel unsafe at the meetings <laughs> no <laughs> but did they all get together and vote and get rid of him and say he did yeah hey did, did i tell you that right actually told same thing they called the cops on me and they told the cops that i that i I don't i mean i don't know exactly what words they used but but the police officer who called me he he was he said he's like uh sir uh donnie creekmore um this is uh detective uh i don't know what is i can i'm not gonna say his actual name this is detective smith and uh you know there's uh I've, i've heard that you know there's a situation developing with the website and um i wanted to talk to you about that because uh, from what i understand uh you didn't uh you know uh, get ownership of this website uh the proper end of the proper means and then i explained to him what happened and then the guy was like oh i'm uh, sorry to bother you uh <laughs> yes i actually do see that right here that you are the rightful owner of this website and this is not at all as nefarious as they <laughs> Hated right. out to be. I was like, dude, what were they thinking was going to happen? That the cops are just going to be like, <laughs> it's like, dude, like, just complete ridiculous. Oh, I fired up. And dude, it's just, I mean, it's just absurd. You know, I actually, I was, I was going to play the audio for it, but I couldn't find it. I don't have, I wasn't ready. I didn't know we were going to talk about this. And I don't want to waste time clicking around on my computer. Yeah, but, no, we, we really should be talking about the midterms. So, yeah, yeah, the midterms for sure. So, um, <clears throat> tell me when I can pull on that. Okay. So Arizona, I don't know if uh, everybody's been keeping up on Arizona, but not at all right here. I'm I'm completely ignorant. Very interesting what happened there. It's always Maricopa County. Um, Last time it was the Sharpies. This time, um, 20% of the polling locations had printer issues. And the printer settings weren't printing out the ballots in a way that the tabulators could read the barcode. And then they were like, oh, well, just take your ballot and put it in this slot three and it'll get counted down at the counting center instead of getting tabulated on site. <coughs> and everybody knows that Republican voters, especially Carrie Lake voters, they vote on game day. Oh, yeah. And the Democrats try to get everybody to get their ballots in early before anything comes out about the election. Because if you notice, you know, Jack Posobiec made a, a, a really good, um, a re- did a really good report. And what he was saying is more about ballots than votes. And what he meant by that is, you know, if you look at the polling, when it buzzes, right? Yeah, yeah, word. So if you look at the polling, um, things really swung the Republicans' way in the last month. The problem with that is, in most of these places, they had been voting for a month already. So they already had a bunch of ballots in. So with the Democrats, it's like the race to get people to fill out their ballots, to get them in. 
before they, you know, really dig into what's going on here. Um, as far as, you know, the debates or anything like that, you notice how they put off the debates and put off the debates. Like Fetterman didn't debate Oz till right at the end. At that point, most of the Democrats would probably put their ballot in. Right. Okay. Right. And then they saw Fetterman and they were like, oh my God, why'd I vote for this guy? But it's too late. They already put in their ballot. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, they're, they're about getting as many ballots out into as many hands, getting them filled out and just pressing, pressing, pressing on the, on the ballots. And, you know, the other thing that you notice is, then this is, you could call this Republican, you know, kind of failed strategy, really. It, but it's also kind of, you know, just the way it is. The Democrats have way more money. True. I mean, way more money. They spend an average of two to three hundred million on the four or five Senate races in the swing states. OK, Republicans do not have that kind of money. So what Republicans were doing was saving to run their ads until the end. But the but the Democrats have been running attack ads for months. And so they got a bunch of people to fill out ballots and stuff while they controlled the airwaves with all their money. I mean, bro, uh, you know, so it's it's like a lot. There's a lot of factors into why the red wave didn't happen as big as we would have wanted. Well, it seems to me that so it seems to me that the reason that the red wave didn't happen the way that we wanted is that there's not enough red, white and blueprints in this country. Because the red, white, and blueprint boys out there in Shasta County, those boys successfully, and ladies, they successfully led, you know, recall efforts in the dead heat of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and successfully switched the, the mass mandates off, the vaccine mandates off. I mean, they, they reduced the uh, time limit, you know, how there's a three-minute time limit for public comments. They got, they got rid of that. And I mean, they just, you know, those guys out there, they did it and, and they didn't use the Republican party at all. They started their own packs. They started their own movements. They, they, they knocked on the doors and they called the people and they did the texting they did the emailing themselves. And, you know, it seems to me that that kind of, you know, call it the tea party, call it grassroots, call it whatever you want. That kind of effort is what we really need in this country. It's efforts like this. We need to like you know, more alternative news sites, cowbell. We need more cowbell. Yeah. More cowbell. Well, you know, but you also got to be realistic, you know, red, white, and blueprint. What they did is completely amazing, right? Totally. Okay. They had uh, some strong financial backing that helped. Yep. And they're in like a 60% red district. True. So, you know, it's possible, you know, uh, to do something like that here where we're like D38, we need a lot more money. Yeah, it's going to take some work. We we got an uphill battle. You but know. The, the thing you can do in Humboldt, and the, everybody's got to get out and vote. That's the problem. If you look at the conservative turnout, if conservatives would just turn out, because the Dem turnout's horrible. Independents, too. Yeah, and the, if the conservatives and the independents would actually turn out and get together and actually vote, that this county would change because the Democrats are, are lazy and entitled, and they don't think they need to vote. And they're like, oh, this place is like 90% Democrat. Like, Republicans never win anything around here. Yeah. And, and you know, I looked at the numbers for this last uh, supervisor election, and I was just pulling my hair out. I was just like, oh, oh my God. Like, if conservatives would have just showed up, we wouldn't be looking at this progressive nightmare that we have coming here. Was it January when she gets sworn in? <sighs> dude, seeing Larry, dude. dude, seeing Larry Doss lose was so heartbreaking. I mean, that is – Larry Doss is one of the best men that I've come to know – I mean, that guy, like, he, he was not a politician at all. And that's the best thing. And that was, that, that to me, it was my favorite thing about him. You know what I mean? Like, because when you actually talk to the dude, he was just like, like, full blown eye contact, interested in what you're having to say, you know, and seeing eye to eye, but then also willing to have his differences with you. And then the local media just railroaded him and they made him out to be, you know, a carpet bagger and all this thing. This guy's lived here his entire life. You know, yeah. he owns two properties, you know, and he lives and he lives, he has two different homes. You know, it's like, this right. is a huge, this is a rural county. And if you can do it and if you have an office space in Eureka, but you also have a home in Oric, of course, you're going to have multiple properties because at a certain point, it just doesn't make sense driving all over the place all the time. 
What's wrong with having multiple properties? I would love to have multiple properties. I, I mean, God bless him for being so successful. Make him more qualified? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. You know, maybe the guy. I mean, the guy's he's a successful business owner. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it blew me away. I, but really, it all boiled down to like you're saying. It's just a really, really sad turnout. You know, between Republicans and Independents, they just literally. It's just like okay, Democrats, you can just go ahead and have Humboldt County. Well, I saw all the people today posting their like nihilistic libertarian <clears throat> like, you know, rants about the two party system and how voting's a waste of time and all that. And you know, I just to to actually sit there and act like California would be exactly the same under Newsom or Dolly. I mean, that's just I, I don't understand how you get to that. You know, I mean, I used to have a lot of those thoughts like, oh, the two party system, it's all screwed. And but then COVID happened and I saw what happened in Republican states and I saw what happened in Democrat states. And there's definitely a big difference. I got plenty of issues with the Republican Party. Don't get me wrong. But it is definitely the lesser of two evils. And you have to accept the fact that we're in a two party system. You can do whatever you want to try to work against that. But wasting your vote is not helping anything, you know, and, and it's not even showing up. And then don't complain. You know, it's funny that I saw a lot of these people that were complaining and protesting during COVID also explaining to me why they don't vote. Well, I mean, and I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around like, do you think do you think that I would have gotten voted off? Do you think that if, if all of them had done the precinct strategy with us? I mean, because because we both know that the same people that are being nihilist didn't show up to do precinct strategy. No, <clears throat> no, I, I tried to, to get people to do it. And some people did, but we didn't have enough people. If we had enough people, we could have taken over the local GOP and we could have turned it into something effective. And that's, it's all about strategy. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, there's a two party system, but what's your strategy of winning? Right. Do you think that you're going to like wave a wand at some time and then you're going to make it to where there's no, no longer a two party system? Or do you go and do you take over one of the two parties and, and use it to crush the other one? Exactly. Or just use it to just make things better to use it to use it. To, like, okay. So like, like I wouldn't, I would be pro Democrat if they weren't for all the terrible things that they're for right now. Well, they're you completely I mean? under the control of, you know, <laughs> basically, you know, globalists. Yeah, but my, my point you know, being... I, I could say a yeah. lot of things about him. <laughs> Let's like just call JFK, him globalist. Like JFK, I would have supported John F. Kennedy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I would have. But I think that at, in this day and age, he would be on Bannon. Right, yeah. He was, Do you know what I mean? He was pro-life and pro-Second Amendment. So right. he couldn't be a Democrat anymore. Right. They'd throw him out. You're, you're, just, you're not allowed in the cult. Right. You know, and, and, you know, and that's the whole thing that's, that's fascinating to me. It's like when people don't get into the precinct strategy, you know, and, and they didn't do that here locally, even though they had both of us and, you know, a handful of other folks that actually did get involved, all of us kind of beating the drum going like, no, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this, you know? And it was just like, sadly, it was just a tiny bit, not enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then also just crazy happen chance. Like you're saying three different people couldn't, you know? No, and, and it's funny because they're like, you know, vote with your money and don't support <laughs> corporations and do all these things. And I'm like, yes. And also vote for the most libertarian populist candidate that's on the ballot. That's of, of between the two parties that have a chance. You know, like you, are, they're not a pure libertarian. They're not purely populist or whatever, but they're more so than the alternative. Otherwise, you end up with this like hellscape that we have coming up here. Like, <laughs> Arroyo, Wilson, and Madrone are just going to hammer through all this woke progressive agenda all day long. And Rex and Macello are just going to be sitting there helpless at why it happens. And that's what's coming to Humboldt County. Like, you know, I, I've had plenty of criticism of uh, Virginia Bass, but we're going to miss her. Because she was at least moderate on some things. And she would be the one that would come in and stop this a lot of this crazy woke stuff from going through and uh yeah she's not gonna be here anymore so buckle up kids yeah this broadcast was sponsored in part by humboldt freedom coalition and humboldt state of mind tv my name is donnie creekmore with loco populist podcast thank you again for watching you can find this and all of our content at lostcoastpopulist.com